So today we're beginning a new sermon series entitled, What's Love Got to Do With It? Got to do. Y'all know y'all. Ooh, everybody knows it, huh? Ooh, that old classic Tina Turner, huh? Well, we all know Tina Turner. She, uh, she asked a question. She asked that question in her song, uh, but for a very different reason than what I'm focusing on today. In fact, in her song, she downplays the significance of love. Did you know that? Calling it a secondhand emotion mm. and a sweet old fashioned notion. What's up with that? Listen, as much as I love Tina Turner, as much as I appreciate her and, and, and love her gift, and man, let me tell you, she's one of the very, uh, uh, I mean, we've lost all the great ones, right? We only have Stevie Wonder, Tina Turner, right? Who else we got out there? Smokey Robinson, he's still kicking it, right? Listen, as much as I love Tina Turner, I, I, I'm sorry, but she's wrong. She's wrong. However, she was right in one sense. The way love is so flippantly used in society, it could actually be categorized as simply a secondhand emotion. But for those of us who understand the true essence of love and its depth of meaning biblically, it means considerably more. And we want to take into consideration the Apostle John, the beloved. Who better to speak on love than the beloved? Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, and although it doesn't say it in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, which is what we're going to read, almost all theologians and scholars and even the early church fathers gave him the credit for 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and of course, Revelation. And who better to speak on love than the Apostle John himself? Now, in, remember, in those days when John begins to write these letters, Paul, Peter, all these guys, we have to keep in context why they're writing what they're writing to the church. Now, in 1st John, we don't really know who or what church he's writing, but we know by the writings in 1 John that he is writing to the church. We just don't know exactly which church, but he is writing to the church. And what he's doing is he's clarifying something. There's things going on am amongst the church that imposes him to write this letter. There's a lot of false teachers that were a big problem in the early church. And keep in mind, that there was not a complete New Testament Bible that believers would refer to. So many churches, they would fall prey to pretenders who taught their own ideas and advanced themselves as leaders, like what we see today. So there's nothing new. It happened then, and it's still happening today. The devil has no new tricks. He tries to bring confusion. So you have to be very careful of what you consume and what you open your ears to on YouTube, on social media. Because if you notice today, everybody is a preacher. Everybody calls themselves an apostle. Everybody calls themselves a prophet. But the Bible says that by their, you shall know them. So it takes time to get to know somebody. That's why I take everything with a grain of salt because you just really don't know who they are. You got to spend time with people. So that's why... Having a pastor in your life is so important. A pastor that walks with you, that you hear every day, that you see, that you can eat with. That's why it's so important to have somebody that can bring correction and listen to you with love, with wisdom. Not just some guy that you see on, on social media. So be very, very careful because what happened back then is still happening today. So John, he writes this letter to set the record straight on some very important issues, particularly concerning the identity of Jesus Christ because he himself was a witness. He saw Jesus. He walked with Jesus. So there was a lot going on. 
And because John's letter was about the basics of Christ, it, it, it helped the readers reflect honestly on their faith. It begin, they begin to question themselves and their faith and who is it that they are believing and who they're following. It helped them answer the question, are we true believers? Are we really from the way? Because that's what they called them back then, the way. See, so John tells them that they could tell by looking at their actions. If they loved one another, that was evidence of God's presence in their lives. But if they bickered and fought all the time or were selfish and did not look out for one another, they were actually betraying that they, in fact, did not know God. So we all know that same, right? Action. So what's love got to do with the church? I want to answer four questions of one entity. The first one, and I want you to take notes because I want you to, this is what you guys are going to talk over when you go to your soul groups, at least the two of them. I want you to take notes, and if you have questions, this is the soul groups where you want to act, and, uh, ask those questions and talk about it. Number one, what's love got to do with my salvation? Well, let's go to the Bible. 1 John 4. 9 to 10, New Living Translation. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. You see, we didn't love God and we didn't know what love really was until God showed us what it looked like. Do you agree with that statement? God doesn't give love. God is love. It's part of his character. So you cannot love yourself, let alone anyone else, until you have a relationship with God. He will show you what true love is. We all know the greatest, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, right? John 3, 16. For God so... Love the world. The world is an enemy of God. Did you know that? The world is an enemy of God. Just turn on the news. And those of you who follow God truly, you look at what's going on and you're like, oh my God, it, this is, it, it turned your stomach. Because they're the enemy of God. He who did not know God is an enemy of God. We can't love God until we are born again then we have the Spirit of God living in us, enabling us to be able to love. God loved his enemies. He loved his enemies. The world hated him, but God loved them. God loved those who didn't love him. And that is the most extreme sense of love, and that's who God is. He is love. God showed us pure love, unconditional, unwarranted, undeserved unmatched. God shows selfless love in letting Jesus go from being in his side in the glory of heaven to come down to earth knowing what was going to happen to him all for our benefit. All for our benefit. Jesus showed us his unmatched love when he was willing to be tortured to face death and be spiritually separated from the Father so that we would be born again and not have to face the spiritual death that he went through in paying the penalty for our sins. So God could not have shown a greater example of sacrificial love than sending his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. Jesus could not have shown a greater example of love than to die for us. Church, if it's if, it, if it's not for, 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 for love, there would not have been salvation. Had it not been for love, you and I would not be sitting here today. Can you understand the magnitude of God's love for us? Salvation could not have been accomplished without love. So what's love got to do with my salvation? Everything. Question number two. What's love got to do with my relationship with God? 
Have you asked yourself that question? What does love have to do with my relationship with God? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 from the NIV translation. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Mm, I love this. I love this. Paul highlights that because of Jesus' love, in what he did for us, there should be a response. Mm. A lot of y'all don't like that word, response. Because of his love shown to us, Paul is saying there should be a response from us. You don't just learn about this Jesus that did all this and then all of a sudden you just look at it, hear it, read it, and do nothing about it. His sacrifice demands a response from us. You see, if we understand the love behind Jesus' sacrifice and we understand how that afforded us the opportunity to escape eternal destruction, then we will be compelled to respond. You cannot stay the same. There is absolutely no way that you can receive the sacrifice, the atonement, the finished work that Jesus did and not respond. It is absolutely impossible for you to comprehend it and not do anything about it. It might take us a while to really fathom and grasp the depth of what Jesus did for us, but we need to understand that what Jesus went through for us and his enemies is something no one would ever have done for us or could have done for us. Only Jesus, only Jesus could have been able to do what he did. So therefore, our appreciation and gratitude for our rescue and adoption into the family of God should put a fire, a fire in us that drives and fuels us to do everything we can to please Him. How many want to live to please God? We want to please Him. Why do I want to please Him? Because of what He did for me. There's nothing I could do to repay him. I don't do for him to repay him because I can never repay him. I do for him for love. For love. It's not merely out of a sense of duty or obligation. It's not merely out of a fear of consequences if we don't. Our devotion and obedience need to stem from our love for God because if it's driven by any other things I mentioned, it will no doubt be superficial and short-lived. There can be no other reason to do for God other than love. See, my relationship with God needs to be based in my love for God. I already know the basis for his relationship with me is built on love. I already know that. So I don't ever have to be concerned whether or not God loves me. He has loved me from the very beginning. He's loved you from the very beginning. So you never got to question his love for you. You already know he loves you as you are, but loves you way too much to leave you as you are. How many know that? So we already, we got that established. The question is this, what is my relationship with him built on? If it's built on anything less than love, then it won't stand the test of time. If the reason I'm a Christian is merely to escape the flames of hell, guess what? It's not going to work. So me preaching to people, hey, you know, if you don't receive them, you're going to hell, right? Am I trying to get a response from people by, by, by saying, no, I... You don't preach hell to scare people into heaven. It's not going to work. You preach love. You preach the redemption work, the complete work in the cross. People need to know that there's a God that loved them. 
And when you preach Jesus and you preach love and you preach the cross, what happens is love compels them. Love convicts them. Love brings them to their knees. If the basis of my relationship with God is what I can get from God, then it's based in something other than love. You ever found yourself there? God, this one time, if you do this for me, y'all been there, right? Lord, just this one time. And God is up there just laughing. Like, Girl, I created you. I know you. Listen, if I think God is great when things are going great, but when my life gets tough and I find myself wondering if I want to continue to serve God, who's going to allow these things to happen to me, then my relationship with God is based in feelings and not love. You can't base your relationship in God with feelings. It's got to come from love. See, love doesn't change with varying circumstances. It doesn't. It's constant. It's consistent. No matter what I'm going through, no matter the trials, the pain, because love is what compels me. Love is what drives me. Love is what keeps me consistent regardless of what I go through in life. If my relationship with God is based in love, then I will love God. I will love what God loves and hate what God hates. I won't compromise my values. I won't compromise my convictions. You want to know why? Because they come from a love with God. So what's love got to do with our relationship with God? Everything. Number three. Write this down. What's love got to do with my relationship with others? What's love got to do with me and you? 1 John 4, 11, NIV. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Look how simple. Nothing deep. Just simple. Since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. See, now that we know what love is, now that we have been compelled to love him by putting him first in our lives, then that should also change how we operate in our relationships with others. I'm not talking about this superficial type of love where we just see each other on Sunday. How you doing? Oh, I've been freaking. Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm talking about real type relationships where throughout the week we're in each other's homes. Nothing official about Soul City Church. Hey, what are you doing Tuesday? Hey, you want to come over? I'll, I'll cook some. Let's just talk. Let's just hang out. I see the day when that's going to happen here. Where it's not a soul group. Where it's not an official. It's just, let's just hang out. Hey, let's just go bone. Hey, let's just go to the movie. Let's just, hey, can we exercise together? I'm struggling in my exercise. I need, a, I need somebody to keep me accountable. Can, can you walk with me Saturday mornings? That's that, that kind of relationship. Where it's inconvenience, but because I love you, I'm going to do it. Where I can fully trust you with my pain, with my hurts, with what's going on in my family. That kind of relationship is the relationship that we need to strive towards. We're not there yet, but if you can ask God to help you strive to love one another that way this will be an amazing powerful healthy church none like no other I'm telling you church that's what we gotta strive for see our love for others was, was tainted before it may have been conditional it may have been something like love those who love me first it may have been based only in feelings but the love of God is not based on feelings. It's not based whether you rub me the right way or the wrong way. I, I might rub you the wrong way as a path. You're like, I don't like that path. And that's okay. I get it. 
I get it. And maybe that's why people don't stay. I don't know. Because people are not honest. Like, people are not honest. Like, hey, why you didn't come back? Oh, you know. They, they come up with all kinds of reasons. Like, me, I'm already, a, a, you know, I'm an old man. I, I'm 49 years old. I don't care. Somebody said, well, why? I'm going to tell you straight up. Well, you know, I just, you know, you said this and I didn't like it. <laughs> like, I don't have a problem with being honest, you know. Like, if I did something, I don't know it. You should bring it to my attention in private. I'm not a psychic. I mean, God speaks to me, but he ain't going to tell me everything. Because here you are, offended, living your life all week, offended, holding on to offense. And here I am, living my life, living la vida loca. And you're living your life offended about something either I said or did. But true love is not based on feelings. True love says, hey, pastor, can I have a word with you? Hey, the other day, you know, you said something and kind of, I took it the wrong way. Can you, can you clarify? That's true love. That's true love. Because the enemy takes those offenses. And he starts making it bigger and bigger. And then you keep wondering and you keep thinking and then all hell breaks loose and then by the time you know it, you're sick. By the time I know you could bring sickness to yourself. Stressing over something that never even happened. But in your mind, it happened. You got to be careful. But now, my love for you needs to be based in the kind of love that I've experienced from God. 1 John 3, 16 to 18, New Living Translation states this. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. Watch this. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. What? This can't be right. Look at verse 17. If someone has enough money to live well, that's a key right there. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. I didn't have this plan, but I just feel compelled to do it. Sister Erin, stand up, Sister Erin. And I, I, I apologize. I don't mean to embarrass you. This is, this is Sister Erin. Give it up for Sister Erin. May I have a seat, Sister Erin? Sister Erin found Soul City Church through another sister of the church. Who invited her? Or she she actually saw the post on Facebook. Is that correct? So she felt compelled and she wanted to try it out. And she came. Soon you're going to hear Sister Erin's story. She'll tell her story. Just know that whenever you shake her hand and you hug her, you're, you're shaking a miracle. You're hugging a miracle. Let's just put it that way. Since she started coming to Soul City, her, her life is changing. God is working in her life. She got herself a job, and she's been, she, she lives all the way in Kentucky Avenue, and she either walks it here, or she takes an Uber, or sometimes the bus that leaves a one tune, and she walks it the rest of the way. That's dedication. That's dedication. She takes buses all the way to work. She just started getting a new job, and, and God is just changing her life and opening doors. She doesn't have a car yet, and I'm not going to go into details when she shares her story, and she, she, you'll hear it, but she doesn't have a car, and she walks it anyway. Us as a church, we need to see this, and it should compel us. Somebody should say, hey, can I give you a ride? I don't mind picking you up, bringing you and then taking you home. I don't mind because well, that's my sister. 
That's my sister in Christ. So love, compel- it might be a little inconvenience getting on my way, but we need to give a ride. So love is action. Love should compel us to look out for one another. We see a need, we try our best to fulfill that need. We saw a video a few Sundays ago about Sister Sarah with her little son Max when he found out he got cancer. I was so proud as a pastor. The men jumped into action. They all donated money and they ordered twin beds for her sons. The women jumped into action. They bought with their money all the sheets, the beds, everything for their sons to be prepared. That's love in action. That is love in action. When John writes that Jesus laid down his life, he wasn't just referring to the cross. He wasn't just referring to the cross. It wasn't just his dying on the cross. It was his dying to self. Dying to self daily. Oh, it doesn't feel good to die to self. And sometimes God allows certain things to happen in our lives, in our families, so that we can die to self. Pride starts to sneak in and God has to allow certain things to show you who's the boss. To show you that you ain't God. To show you that you done wasted all your resources here, there, there, and you left him as the last resort. He'll humble you to show you, to mold you that he is first. In every situation, God is first. Before your family, before your job, before your money, before your properties, God is first. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, that if we're going to follow him, we must deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow him. Taking up our cross means dying to self That's what Jesus did every day in every way. He humbled himself and washed feet. He said he did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. See, before we came to Christ, our love may have just been lip service. Just lip service. Some of you are still in that season, in that stage in life. You're in lip service season. You still haven't had an encounter with God. You come to church, but you really haven't had an encounter. You might say you love God, but words don't mean nothing in the kingdom of God. Action is what says a lot about who an individual is within the kingdom of God. I don't care how much you say you love God. No, no, I want to see action. God desires to see action. God sees your heart. And what's in your heart is manifested on the outside. You put a sponge in water and you squeeze it, you're not going to get Coca-Cola. You're going to get water because the sponge is submerged in water, not Coca-Cola. My question to you, church, is when you're being squeezed, what's coming out of you? What's coming out of you when you're being squeezed through life's trials and trauma, what is coming out of your heart? Love is so flippantly used, isn't it? We can easily just say it without meaning it. I love you, man. You love me. I've never seen you do anything to show me you love me. You've never been out of your way for me. You never brought me a little sandwich. You never took me to Vanessa's coffee. You love me. You got to show people you love them. When was the last time you treated somebody out for coffee, for a little thing, just to listen to them? Just to listen to them. That shows love. Listening to people that you know can never repay you or do anything for you again, that's love. We got to get into practice of that with each other. Show love. Listen to people's story. Open up to people. 
the Greek language actually had different words for love based on the different kinds of love. Agape love. Agape love, that's, that's from a parent and a child. Phileo, right? We get Philadelphia, which is brotherly type of love, friend. You got eros love. That's between a husband and wife. That's lust, right? Should be lusting after nobody but your spouse. Come on, can I get a witness? Eros love, husband and wife. Agape love. Now that's, that's the love you want. Agape love is the love that God has towards us. It's the love that needs to be part of all my relationships because it is the deepest most sacrificial and unconditional aspect of love, agape love. Agape love. John is telling us that love is a verb. Love is action. When you have the agape love, people know it based on what you do. They're like, wow, that's... Do you know in the Bible, you know how they knew that they were followers of Jesus? They called them the way. You want to know how? When they looked at it, oh, they, that, that, they're from the way. The way they knew is how they love one another. That's how they knew. Not because they carried a big Bible. They didn't have Bibles back then. Not because of the way they dressed, because they all pretty much looked the same. They didn't have much choices, much fashion back then, y'all. No Nikes. Mm-mm. Pretty much the same sandals, right? Same sandals, right? Same little robe, unless you were from royalty, then you had the silk, right? But most of them had a little cotton or a little sackcloth, whatever they could get. But they didn't know them. By, they didn't know them about their singing, about that. No, they knew them by how they treated one another. Like, wow, they bring in food to one another. They, they help each other. They carry each other's burdens. So when the outsider saw that, that's what compelled people to get converted to Jesus. Agape love. So John is telling us that love is a verb. You see, I can say I love you, but if it's real, I will be showing you. It will show in how patient we are with each other. Right? Don't be leaving this thing and somebody's in the way. You start honking at them because you want to go eat. Where's your agape love? Be patient. It's going to show how generous we are with one another, how forgiving we are with one another, and how much grace we show one another. It will show in how much we're willing to be inconvenienced. So what's love got to do with our relationship with others? Everything. My last and final point, number four, write this down. What's love got to do with my service? What's love got to do with my service? What I do for God? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3 from the NIV. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Let me give you a visual. That's how some of us sound. It's loud, but that's all it is. It's noisy, but it's not doing anything. It's just a big loud sound, but it's not effective. A clanging sound. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. What is the Apostle Paul's point? His point is, 
If I do any of all these wonderful things without the motive of love, it is of no real value. It doesn't mean these things have no value. A faith that can move mountains is of great value. But if love is missing, it's of no value. If I give all I possess to the poor, but without love as my motive, then they will benefit, but I won't. There will be no reward from God for it because I did it with interior motive. In other words, Paul is saying, in essence, I don't care if I speak the language of angels. If I'm not doing it in love, then it's not angelic, it's annoying. <laughs> if I'm not doing all these things in love, it's not angelic, it's annoying. Let's not be an annoying church. Let's not be annoying Christians. Let's be Christians that act in the agape love. The love that only God gives. I don't care if I'm prophetic and can solve the most difficult riddle or mystery or if I'm more knowledgeable than anyone else. If there's no love driving me, then I'm nothing. No matter how strong my faith is, if love isn't in my heart, then it doesn't matter. If I'm the most generous person in the world and sacrifice my very self for the good, but love is not the factor and basis for such activity, then I have gained absolutely nothing. If there is no love for God or for my fellow man, then no amount of good deeds will do me any good. I can say it's all for God and I can look godly and have people acknowledge my contributions. But in the absence of love, I am no better off personally in the eyes of God than if I have done nothing. Mark 12, 33, NIV. To love him, God, with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Wow. So, love is being driven real hard here. It's being driven by Jesus, by John, by Paul. It's being driven hard. I think we get the picture, don't we? We can be serving God and doing spiritual things, but that's not what he's interested in if our devotion and service isn't done in love. In fact, if it's not, I think he's more disgusted than pleased. Because we're doing it with interior motives other than to bring him glory. And the Bible says that God does not share his glory with no one. He's a jealous God. So if we're doing things with the motives of bringing ourselves glory, bringing ourselves attention, God is a jealous God. He is not pleased. So we need to check our hearts. In the Old Testament, there are various places where God talks about this displeasure over his people's religious activities when they were living in sin. Listen, church, we're fooling ourselves if we think we are pleasing God simply by doing godly things. Don't mistake your work for God with time with God. Because some people think because I'm serving in church, I'm doing for God, then we must be okay. That is the biggest lie. You know, the devil can use ministry to stray you away from God. Did you know that? Because we make ministry an idol. Many pastors fall prey to making ministry an idol. Ministry is not God. Serving God, working for God, doing for God should never replace your personal intimate time with God. I'm looking to get attention if I'm doing it for the purpose of getting something from God in return. It's not right. 
This shows that I don't really care about God or others. I care about me. Selfishness. Why should I think God's going to honor that? What's love got to do with my service to God? Everything. And in conclusion, Bible commentary writer William Barclay wrote this. More people have been brought into the church by the kindness of of real Christian love than by all the theological arguments in the world. And more people have been driven from the church by the hardness and ugliness of so-called Christianity than by all the doubts of the world. Now, that's his opinion. I don't know if there's any scientific or statistics to prove, but I would agree with him based on my conversations with many people that are living out in the world, been church hurt. You see, theological arguments are important, but not more important than love. They will know we are Christians not by our Bible knowledge. Not how deep we can teach scriptures, not by our church attendance, not how many people come to Jesus. Although all these things are very important. But they will know us by our love for one another and love is action. Love will be the most convincing factor in winning someone for Christ. Love. When you invite them out to your dinner table, when you invite them out to dinner and hear their stories, when they can see how you live your life with your family, with your spouse, with your friends, take them out to fish and take them out boat, when they see you, don't invite people to come with you to the church gathering on a Sunday. First, invite them to your house first. Invite them outside to do something fun with you first. Build a relationship with them. Let them hear your story. And then say, hey, would you care to be my guest on a Sunday as I gather with my brothers and sisters? 99.9% of times they're going to say, absolutely. You want to know why? Because you showed them love. Whether you realize it or not, you showed them Jesus. Jesus. You're like, wow, this guy took me out, invited me, treated me, took me to his home, which is so private and personal, hanging out with his family, told me his story. He even took time to listen to me. Sure, I'm going to go with you. And what happens is you're sowing the seed, you're sowing a seed, you're sowing a seed, and the Holy Spirit does the rest. My friends, love. It's the most convincing factor winning someone to Christ. It's easy to see how important love is. So what's love got to do with it? Everything. Everything. I want to challenge you, church. There's always a challenge after the preaching. I want to challenge you to love more with your actions. Love more with your actions. Love is not a feeling. Love is obedience. I'm loving because he loved me first. I didn't know what love was until I had an encounter with Jesus. So I want to challenge you this week. Show love to one another. Find somebody that you don't know and start making dinner dinner dates with each other. Go out. One family gets to know another family. I want to see that happening in this church. Some of us only see each other on Sundays. That's not the way it's supposed to be, quite frankly. When we come in here, all of y'all, you look around right now, you look around and a lot of you don't even know each other. I do because I've gone out with y'all. I've heard your stories. 
they visit you, some of you, in homes. And you probably say, well, that's because you're the pastor. No, my friend, that's not because I'm the pastor. Something I've always done, whether I was a pastor or not. Not because I'm a pastor. Position don't mean nothing. Titles don't mean nothing. It's how I've always lived my life. I've learned it from somebody else. I've been discipled to do that. So wherever you come from, whatever church you come from, however you were raised, I want you to take that, just throw it out the window. Throw it out the window. Let's start new. Let's start fresh. Let's be a church that starts practicing what the early church did. Let's visit one another. Let's go hang out. Let's, let's hear each other's stories. Let's grow together in our faith. Let's not try to be something we're not. We're all sinners. And we all come short and we all need each other. Let's grow together. Let's not be embarrassed of our past. Let's try to work to strive to be better, godly. But more important, let's do things in the name of love. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, I have spoken your word as you have given it to me. Holy Spirit, I pray that you bring conviction. I pray you touch the hearts as only you know how to do. Father, I know that there's someone here who really desires to know you. Not religion, but really know you. Father God, I just pray for that person. I pray, God, that you will begin to work in that person. <laughs> so much struggles are going on. So much going on, Lord, in our lives. But it's so easy to get distracted. If you're here this morning with nobody looking, everybody's eyes closed, head bowed, I want to give you an opportunity to ask Jesus into your life. In, in other words, if, if you know that you don't have a relationship and you say, you know what, Pastor Ariel, I want to start walking and start to know Jesus. I just don't know where to start. Well, guess what? Today... It's a good day to start. And I promise you that if you fill out a connection card afterwards, leave it with us, we're going to call you and we're going to help you walk in this Christian journey because the fact of the matter is you cannot do this alone. None of us can. We all need help. So if that's you this morning with nobody looking, at the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand high enough for me to see it and then put it right back down. And I'm going to have a general prayer. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hand. God bless you, brother. One. Anybody else that says, Pastor, I would like a relationship with Jesus. If there's no one else, you may put down your hand. Let's say those prayers together. Say, Lord, thank you for loving me first. Holy Spirit, change me. Fill me with your power and guide me to all truth. In Jesus' name. The prayer is not what's going to save you. It's what you believe in your heart to be true, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you follow his teachings, you repent from your sins, walk away from them, and follow the teachings of Jesus, you're going to start seeing fruit built up in your life over time. But you cannot do it alone. So I'm going to ask you to make sure to fill out a connection card we will call you and follow up and help you in your walk with God. Church, put your hands together. Give God a praise. <clears throat>